Thank you very much for joining our program, Professor Dola, and thank you for inviting us to your home to have a talk about the phenomenology of the spirit and to enlighten us uh, more on the on the book in in uh, maybe in more general terms. We have been reading with our listeners uh, the preface of the book, as we have uh, told you, and we would like to to start out by simply uh, asking. Uh, maybe the most general question, what is this book uh, and what is its significance uh, in the in the history of philosophy? Well, you start off by the question which is impossible to answer, I mean, somehow. Well, what is this book? Uh, it's, it's a book, well, it, I suppose you gave some background information to your listeners or whatever in the previous um, emissions and the book was written in 1806, published in 1807, and um, turned into this mythological book of the history of philosophy. And the point of its being written is actually the first point, the, the first thing to point out as to its significance, because it was written in a very dramatic historic juncture. And um, that, well, there is this anecdote of uh, Hegel when he was writing the last page of the book. There was a uh, the Battle of Vienna, where Napoleon famously has beaten the Prussian army, and the day after having completed the phenomenology, he opened his uh, window and saw this Napoleon on the white horse uh, riding through the town of, of Vienna. And uh, there is this, this mythical, iconic moment of European history when you have one of the biggest philosophers in the entire tradition, Hegel, completing his first great book. Uh, the most mythical book in, in, in the canon, probably, and and on the next day, sort of confronting Napoleon in this historic moment. Which, I mean, the, the meaning of this historic moment was the meaning of uh, a continuation or completion or something of of the French Revolution, of the the, 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 the break that the French Revolution presented. And, and Hegel at the time saw Napoleon as beating the Prussians, I mean, imposing certain ideas of the continuation of the French Revolution throughout throughout Europe, Be, being beating the Prussians as the most conservative sort of uh, state aristocracy, uh, uh, representative of the, of the old order around. So the, there is an emblematic moment of the end of an era and the beginning of another era. And this was, this was in the air. This was in the air. This was, uh, Hegel was maybe the one who could articulate this in, in the best way. But this sense of the spectacular historic moment to which this belongs was a general, belonged to the general perception at the time. And the whole of German uh, idealism, starting with Kant in his famous uh, writing about the French Revolution, and then Fichte in his famous young, when he was young, two books in support of the French Revolution. And then Hegel, who saw in the French Revolution, the, he, he, he used this sentence in the history, or the philosophy of history, the sky has descended onto earth. So he, he saw this as an absolutely momentous moment. And from this momentous historical moment, there follows the, the idea and the task, uh, the agenda of this book. This is the, the book which, which has in its um, in its in its uh, blueprint in its very inception. Uh, it has the idea that this is the book which could only be written now at this historic moment. It only can. It's not that some philosopher, usually philosophy is something that aims at universality or something which is um, eternity, something which is elevated above history. But um, Hegel's aim is that his philosophy, this particular kind of philosophy, the, the aim that he has set for himself, could only be done at this particular historic junction. And this, is, this has nothing to do with the historical uh, relativism, as it were. He, has, he wants to maintain two things. It's only at the particular historic junction and being being completely immersed in this historic moment that one can reach for the absolute. So the absolute and the history don't stand opposed. This was generally seen in the whole history of philosophy. You either go for the absolute and speak about eternal truth or somehow 
uh, about the contingency of uh, relativity of historic historic times, the changeability, etc. For Hegel, the two things go hand in hand. It's only from the contingent historical moment that one can reach for the absolute knowledge. It also sounds a bit like, I mean, the what people sometimes say about Hegel and his grand system, that it's sort of the finalization of the development of history and spirit. And what you're saying sounds a bit more like you could even say that it's an opening instead, or a beginning. It's it's the two things at the same time. It's absolutely the two things at the same time. It's it's a, it's it's a, it's an end. And Hegel very famously proclaimed the end of philosophy, the end of history, the end of art. Somehow he was the man who proclaimed the end. And it's easy to proclaim the end, but the difficult thing is, I mean, that it really works, and he managed. I mean, he did proclaim, and there was indeed an, an, the end of an era. But also this end of an era, and this is why also in his system you have uh, all the traditional themes and concepts of, of philosophy have somehow come together or can congregate or can find their place or whatever. So he's a sort of compendium of everything that went before. But at the same time, and this is my well, reading of absolute knowledge, I mean, this is a notion which was most controversial in Hegel uh, because it was seen as a, as, a, as a closure. If you come to absolute knowledge, it's a closure. But I think that at the very same time, at the very point of closure, there is an opening. And this is what, what is Hegel's agenda of absolute knowledge. I mean, absolute knowledge is a permanent agenda of closure and opening of your belonging to a particular historic moment and seeing that you can do philosophy only if you grasp this particular historic moment and thus reach for the absolute. This is the absolute knowledge. So um, absolute knowledge being the final chapter in in, in this magnificent book um, is, of course, I mean, it, it really ends on a grand note with uh, the Golgatha and the absolute spirit sitting on the throne of everything. I mean, it, it's as as uh, grand as one could possibly imagine one ending uh, a book on philosophy. Um, but what you're saying is that this is not just some kind of um, finalizing the, the, the victorious European spirit uh, sitting on top of everything or, or, or dictating the, the movements of the world or, or whatever that might mean, but, but rather something that is two things at the same time. No, I, I think that the, the, the place to start, I mean, this is a book, this is the most ambitious book that was ever written. Uh, it's a book to finish all books. I mean, it, it has, it, who has ever written a book which would not only be development of a certain system, but which would actually present all possible attitudes, all possible attitudes to truth, all possible experiences of knowledge and truth, everything from the most naive to the most complex ones, as uh, a path that one has to undergo in order to, as, as a sort of training path of philosophy, and, and undergo not simply as seeing that some theories are false and bad and the other theories are the correct ones, but actually Hill's contention, this is one of the difficult things in this book, is that without missing the mark with your theory, you will never get there. You will never get to the mark. It's only missing the mark which actually creates the mark as such. You can only get, you can hit the mark, you can get to the point. If, if you take upon yourself the, well, the, uh, the courage to, to also fail, the, 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 uh, the, the history of failures is equally the history of the progress of knowledge and truth. So it, it, it necessarily goes through a series of failures in order to arrive where it should arrive. And now then coming to the most uh, important point, this uh, is a sentence in, uh, in uh, the introduction, not in the preface, but in the introduction, which somehow sums this up, and which is a very simple sentence saying, basically, uh, the path to truth is truth itself. So this, this, is, this is a very strange structure. And this, is, this speaks about the structure of absolute knowledge. Because what does it say about absolute, absolute knowledge? It doesn't say you need a long path in order to arrive at the absolute knowledge and then you'll be there. 
What it says is the opposite. The path to truth is everything. I mean, the, w when you arrive to the absolute knowledge, you only realize that everything happened on the path. You don't arrive to a certain position where you would be on top of everything. Mm -hmm. It's only the path which actually made this position. And the whole thing is on the path. And somehow the, the, the gesture of absolute knowledge is a gesture of retroactivity, that you always have, some, the, the consciousness has some sort of illusion that it will reach this final goal, which would be the absolute whatever. And what you reach in the end is uh, um, an indication, um, a vector, which, is, which points backwards, and which actually just says, well, all these failures that you endured during the way, this is the path to truth. This is all there is to it. There is no truth outside of this. This is only this is absolute knowledge. So in this sense, you can have the rhetoric of Golgotha and finality or whatever, but in some sense, it's an absolutely empty point. Mm -hmm. It's an empty point, which it, you don't learn anything new in the absolute knowledge. You only learn that everything happened on the way. And using the, but the point, um, okay, in English, it's, it's in, in Slovenia is the same point and uh, full stop, like punkt. Mm -hmm. in, uh, so you can see the you can see the absolute knowledge as a sort of full stop. You know, it's it's just a point. You know, it's just an indication that this is you know the ending of something, but the, which actually only refers you back to the sentence because mm -hmm. it's only it's only the point you get one single point without any dimensions that you get in the, at the end. So if, if we then go to the beginning, I mean, uh, one of the uh, passages that we have been discussing earlier on is uh, from the very beginning when Hegel states from the very first sentence that what an author usually does when he's endeavoring to, to write a book, he would explain the purpose of the book and how to proceed and maybe some of the central concepts. But the problem is uh, that when you start out on a sort of a philosophical endeavor of this kind that you have been describing, that you cannot state the concepts uh, clearly, analytically, so to say, uh, beforehand, because it is only in sort of the the effort of the concept that it will unfold itself. But So it seems that we have the full stop at the end and we have a, a, a particular kind of beginning that is... Uh, almost uh, impossible it seems because where do you have your uh, concepts from at the first place yes well the, 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 there is a paradox in in hegel's beginning and what the preface says in the very first sentence on the very first page it says there can be no preface to philosophy there can be no preface to philosophy so the preface is written against the very idea of there being a preface to philosophy and he repeats the same thing in the introduction in the Einführung, like um, pre precisely in, in opposition to Kant, who thought that first you have to consider the conditions of possibility of knowledge before getting to cognition, and they have the same thing. He can't get stuck with uh, the idea of introduction of a preface. He can never get there because the very question that he asks is a question which makes it impossible for him to get there. So there can be no preface, there can be no introduction. And why the hell is then Hegel doing this? I mean, he's doing this um, against his bad proclamation. If what he was saying was true, uh, this text wouldn't exist at all. And it doesn't go only for the preface to phenomenology and introduction, it goes for the phenomenology as such, in a way. Because what is phenomenology? It is a the science of the experience of consciousness, this was the first title of the thing, which means that the consciousness, any consciousness, the non-philosophical consciousness, should take the path of phenomenology to experience all possible ways, all possible attitudes towards the absolute, in order to get where, in order to get to the point where the system can start, in order to get to the page one. And so, the whole phenomenology is an introduction, it's not just the preface, I mean, why why write a book which is an introduction to something that would, you know, happen later? And then if, if you look at the system, okay, logic is only the initial part of a, 
of a long process of aufhebung, which would then go into the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit. So the system itself is an introduction. <laughs> you are, you're being introduced all the time to this final point. But then you get to this final point and what you learn is, hell, there is no final point. Everything you learned was on the way. You know? So you have, as it were, the, uh, the co-belonging of two gestures. The one is the gesture of anticipation and the other one is gesture of, of retroaction. And the gesture of anticipation announces there will be something later, some truth will come. We are now still standing outside. And then the, the gesture of retroaction says, well, there, there is no truth to be learned. Everything you're standing outside was your way of being inside the truth. So you're never inside, you're never outside. This, this may be the, the simplest way to, to, to formulate this. You, you cannot simply start inside the philosophy by making a truth, uh, a, a, a claim which would be absolutely true. You need an externality to arrive there. And this is, uh, is one of the things that Hegel is arguing for in the previous introduction, that uh, he says that the dogmatism in ways of thinking uh, consists in the idea that you can grasp the truth with a proposition. That you can have a proposition, a fundamental principle, and this would be the truth. And then he argues on, he says, the fundamental principle, any fundamental principle, is false for the reason of it being a fundamental principle. I mean, any fundamental principle is false, because what imports is how do we get there and what follows from there. I mean, you, you, you can never have a proposition which would be a true proposition, like uh, whatever, a, a equals A, or which was Fichte's uh, proposal or whatever. I mean, I equals I as, as a fundamental principle for which everything else would unfold. This is completely non-Hegelian way of looking at things. Yes, yeah, so there, there is this strange thing about language which continues to haunt or continues to get back at you right at the moment where you, where you think you've grasped something or you know something, you have some kind of anchor point. And then language, the tool which you use to articulate or point out or say whatever it is you're saying that this is really true and I'm sure sure and certain of it, it tends to trick you. And, and this is much of what Hegel is actually pointing out, that whatever you're trying to figure out or pointing out or indicating as a stable ground then then something happens around the back of of your saying this which which in a sense both makes you miss the mark as as you said earlier and at the same time perhaps get that step further so is this some of the the, the point that is yes well the, the there is something the, there is an argument in the in the preface which could be summed up like by the sentence the destruction or deconstruction of the propositional form by the propositional form itself. So there is something that was generally assumed that belongs to the propositional form. The very, the, 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 the minimal, the Aristotelian kind of S equals P propositional form. So there is something was assumed about this propositional form, which actually was wrong. But in order to see that it was wrong is one, oh, the, the only thing one needs to do is to take this proposition form seriously. And this, this I mean, the, the analysis of the proposition form is actually hangs together very closely with the, with the dictum, the substance is subject. Because, okay, I said before that Hegel actually, okay, he sins against his own principles by writing a preface at all. And then he sins against his own principles by, by saying there can be no single proposition uh, which could spell out the truth of any philosophy. But then he makes the, the, this completely impossible thing and he says everything hinges on understanding that substance is subject. I mean, everything I want to say hinges on understanding this one single, single uh, principle. And it's, it's kind of strange that he, he does this. And one can see this as sort of meta principle. And what, what does this mean? I mean, how does this ho hang together with uh, the question of the very form of proposition, the very form of S equals P? 
you can see that he, he gets, he, he combines two things. He combines um, the notion of sub, the, the notion of substance, which is the which is the the master concept, the key concept of philosophy, and the, the notion of substance combines in itself five six different things. And one thing is that the substance, one thing is temporal. The substance is what endures change. This is the, the temporal aspect of it. The other aspect is is spatial because substance is a spatial metaphor. Substare means to stand under. So it's a sort of underlying thing which stands under, spatially under a surface. In order to get a substance, you have to you know, do away with the surface and get to the to the core, as it were. Then you have the question of uh, necessity and contingency. Substance is what is necessary as opposed to the flow of contingencies. Then you have the, the, the opposition between essence and appearance. Substance is what is essential against the deception of appearances. So the, 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 you have a certain judgment about our capacities of cognition there, because appearances, depending on sensual, are deceptive. You have to get to the Gedanken thing, which is the thing of thought, which is the substance. Substance is what is universal, as opposed to particularity and singularity. And finally, substance is what is one, as opposed to multiplicity, because the very notion of the substance depends on the notion of spelling out a single principle underlying the multiplicity of phenomena, appearances, or whatever. So you have these six points, which actually uh, spell out a certain minimal, that is, uh, six ways of looking at the same well project of philosophy, of traditional philosophy, when we're summing up the metaphysics, as it were. And what Hegel will say is that what what we have to do is what this sentence tries to do is the to undo this notion of substantiality, to undo on all six points, undo the notion of substantiality as this core concept, the core mechanism, the core logic of the philosophical, of the deployment of philosophical concepts. And uh, um, one, one, can, well, it, one can do this by seeing, uh, on the one hand, the propositional form which undoes this. This is one, this is the linguistic part of the argument. The moment you put the, the natural, the natural way of placing a substance in a proposition would be to place it on the place of the subject, to which various predicates are ascribed. And what Hegel says is, the moment you do this, the substance is uh, uh, an empty noise and blows a lot. So you, you, everything that, is, that, that, everything that is contained in the subject can only be spelled out by the series of predicates. You have to start with a certain notion, but this notion, uh, whatever, you start with God, and he says God is an empty noise. God being put in the beginning of a proposition is an empty noise. You, you have to, it, it's only through the, it being spelled out in the predicates, it, it gets, it gets its, uh, its um, uh, content. So it's, it's, it's a pretty formal thing. And you can see that um, the, the way that the, the subject passes into its predicates and is only spelled out in the predicates, it passes into its other, is mediated by its other is the only way that we can we have an access to the to the substance. So uh, I think that one of the key words in the preface is das sich anders werden, sich anders werden, which is uh, actually in the English translation translated rather well by self-othering, self-othering. So you, you have a, you presuppose that the subject is a certain self, that, that, that it is posed in the, in the, it is placed in the position of the uh, Sub, uh, subject of a proposition. But what happens in the proposition itself is the self-othering. It has to become its other in order to be itself. 
And this is the basic idea on all these six counts in Hegel. Uh, everything that seems eternal has to pass in, 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 into time. And this is why you have this radical equation. Uh, the Zeit is the design, the begriff selbst, that the, the concept is the same as time, precisely because everything has to um, be entrusted to the passage of time. And everything that is un, un, underneath has to come to the surface. And it's another important sentence in the preface, that the, 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 the strength of the spirit is only as strong as it entrusts itself to the surface. So something that remains hidden and underneath is just not real. I mean, it, it has no truth. It's only by it coming to the surface that it... It, it, it gains its, its content. And on the question of necessity, he, he uses the, the form of becoming accidental of the essence. It's only by if the essence entrusts itself to accidentality, to the process of contingency, that it can be an essence at all. Otherwise, it's absolutely an empty point. The substance was an empty point unless it took upon itself the risk of becoming its other. And on the last point, the principle of the substance being one. I think what, what the adage substance is subject means is one splits into two. It means that you, you have no one single principle unless it splits into two. I mean, to use, to use this Maoist slogan, one splits into two. I think this follows clearly from Hegel's description of why he maintains substance being a subject. So if you would want to make sort of a metaphysical statement of the minimal structure of being or the universe or how you would formulate it of substance, it would be that the the division or the split itself is in a way uh, the closest we come to a fundamental principle or... Oh yes, de definitely. There's no There's no fundamental principle that there's no fundamental one from which anything would follow. Uh, I think um, this would take more time, but one, one can take passages in, in, this, in this preface where, where I think Hegel puts it absolutely brilliantly that the when he refers to the ancient atomism as the principle of one, etc., the one who actually invented in a way the, the decomposition of all possible entities into atoms which, are, which can be counted for one. Which is sort of you know the imposition of countability, of of unit upon the multiple faces of universe. And what Hegel says there is that the moment they invented the one as an indivisible particle, particle, they also had to invent the void which separates the mm. the particles. And we actually have to look at the basic unity, not as either the one or the void, but the split into the one and the void. So what is Indivisible is division itself. I think this is this is the bottom line of, of Hegel's argument about uh, substance is subject. And there's always this idea in Hegel that in the beginning you have uh, some a spiritual identity or whatever, which is then alienated from itself. It splits, and then in the end it is recuperated. The split is recuperated. It again adds up to this self identity. But the thing is, there is no addition, uh, uh, there is no initial entity which would precede the split itself. You always have a, a sort of retroactive illusion that you have an in itself which was a pure in itself, but which actually only became in itself by it becoming its other, by it being split. So the very notion of spirit, which is supposed to be lost and found again, as you know, right is produced only through the split. It doesn't pre-exist the split. It's only on by it being split and alienated that it becomes spirit at all. So it makes no sense to recuperate something which wasn't there in the beginning. And I think one one of one way of, again of, to propose a handy formula is in that in Hegel what was what you lose the 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 initial in itself, or the initial unity, or the initial uh, thesis, or whatever. But I think what, what sums up Hegel's procedure is that what was lost was never possessed. 
you lose something, but you didn't, you never possessed it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the illusion, the, the retroactive illusion is that you possess something and then you lost it, you got split and alienated, whatever. This is absolutely the retroactive illusion. You didn't have it in the first place. I mean, you can only reconstruct the supposition that you had this plenitude of being, this access to truth, this access to absolute in the beginning, and then it had to sort of got, you know, the origin had to be split, uh, lost. Um, there is a fall. There is, you know, there is some sort of the Christian idea of the fall in the beginning. There was some sort of plenitude. There is a fall. I think the whole Hegelian argument is against this idea. The origin is absolutely empty. There is nothing in the origin. There, there, there is no origin. I mean, everything is created on the way. So this empty origin, once it gets split, you only have the idea that that you have some sort of original plenitude. There's no original plenitude. This is absolutely not the metaphysics of origin. I mean, the, this is one of the Derrida's formulas, the metaphysics of origin, and then the, the supplement, which then screws up this origin, etc. So Hegel is absolutely not that. I mean, he always says the origin is the emptiest point there is. There's no plenitude in the origin. Everything is gained only through the negativity, through the labor of negativity on the way. You produce this entity, uh, which is supposed to be owned in the beginning. But So what, what is lost was never possessed. I think this is a good formula.